This is a story of 49 days of savagery and tragedy, unequaled in the annals of the war in the Pacific. The story begins in Manila, December 13, 1944. On December 13, 1944, a column of Allied prisoners of war, numbering about 1,600, guarded by Japanese soldiers with drawn bayonets, shuffled in ranks of four through Manila's dusty streets to what in pre-war days was known as the Million Dollar Pier. Most of the prisoners were veterans of Bataan, Krigador, or Mindanao, and had been in Japanese custody since 1942. Many had survived the Death March and the Pacific War's most notorious prisoner of war camps. All were now exceedingly weak and malnourished. The prisoners thought they were being sent to Japan, a journey of a week or ten days. If true, it meant that their hope of rescue was ended. Had they known what lay ahead, a journey of delivered butchery and needless sacrifice that would be no less cruel and far more extended than the Death March, many would have chosen immediate death on the bayonets of their Japanese guards. About half were officers, representing about 90% of the field, staff, and medical officers who had sustained the defense of the Philippines for six months without help from the United States. They ranked from Navy commanders and Army and Marine Corps lieutenant colonels down to lieutenants and ensigns. The column of American POWs reached Pier 7 about 2 p.m., it was crowded with Japanese civilians by the hundreds, all well-dressed with wives, babies, and luggage, waiting for evacuation before the fall of the Philippines to the Americans. The Japanese had planned to evacuate their civilians and the prisoners of war sooner, but Manila was under almost constant American air bombardment. For some reason, however, the air attack stopped suddenly on November 28th, giving the Japanese their chance to sneak their freighters into Manila. Bird at Pier 7, a rusty ship was waiting for the POWs. The Orioko Maru had been built as a luxury liner just before the war, but was requisitioned by the Japanese government for a new purpose, the transport of material and troops. The Japanese elected to fill the aft hold first with the highest ranking officers. The first officers who descended were sitting in bays, a double tier system of wooden stalls, something like a Pullman car. Each bay was about nine feet from passageway to rear wall. The Japanese insisted that the Americans sit in rows four deep, each man's back against his neighbor's knee in this nine foot depth. One officer describes it. Long before the hole was filled, the air was foul and breathing was difficult. But the Japanese kept driving more men down the ladder from the deck and kept pushing the first comers farther back into the airless dark. Instead of making more space in the center under the fading light of the hatch, the Japanese insisted that the men in the center should not even sit but should be left standing, packed together vertically. Altogether, about 800 men had been jammed into the dark, airless, foul-smelling hold number four. Meanwhile, the Japanese were herding about 600 other POWs forward into the bow hold. The air here was also foul. Finally, the last party to board, approximately 250 enlisted men and civilians, got the only fully ventilated hold of the Orioko Maru, Hold number two, the second hold forward. About 2,000 Japanese civilians, men, women, and children, as well as some Japanese soldiers, occupied the deck area and the cabins. About 3 a.m. on the morning of the 14th, Orioko Maru weighed anchor and headed out towards the South China Sea, joining a convoy of five merchant ships protected by a cruiser and several destroyers. The convoy turned northward in the darkness, hugging the Luzon shore closely. Shortly after dawn, American planes appeared overhead, 
Japanese gun crews opened fire, guns chattered wildly as the planes made seven or eight attacks before sunset. Overall, six bombs hit the Orioko Maru. One hit the stern of the ship, damaging the steering and killing many POWs. Orioko Maru left the convoy and anchored off of Sueste Point in the mouth of Subic Bay. The Orioko Maru launched one of her boats with a repair crew to attempt to repair the steering gear, but the damage was too extensive. The Orioko Maru was under almost constant attack from the fighters from the USS Hornet. The next morning, Orioko Maru limped across the bay and anchored off of the former U.S. Navy base. Japanese guards and interpreter had abandoned the ship, but the ship's captain remained on board. He told the POWs, with his limited English, that they needed to get off the ship to safety. The POWs scrambled up the ladders. When they got on deck, they found that the ship was parallel to the shore and about 500 yards away from it. The POWs climbed onto the railing and jumped into the water, which was 30 feet below them, feet first. The better swimmers helped the weaker swimmers get to anything that floated. As they swam away from the ship, for the first time, they saw how badly it had been damaged. An entire section of the stern had been blown away, and the ship looked like a pile of scrap metal. The American fighter planes flew low over the water above the POWs. This time, the pilot dipped his wings to show that he knew the men in the water were Americans. The stronger swimmers kept an eye out for anyone having problems swimming. The Japanese sent out a motorboat with a machine gun and snipers on it. Any POW attempting to escape was hunted down and shot. As many as 30 men may have died in the water. POWs climbed up on a seawall and found the Japanese naval landing party had set up a machine gun behind the seawall. At first, the POWs were told to stay in the water, but were eventually allowed to come ashore and rest on the seawall. Around noon, the barefooted, sunburned prisoners were told to get up and march. Two men helped each of the wounded. With bayoneted rifles and clubs, the JNLPs were placed at intervals of about 30 yards along a crooked line of march about a half mile long to a tennis court about 500 yards back from the seawall. By about 3 p.m., the last of the bearded and bandaged men hobbled into their new prison. The survivors of the sinking of the Orioko Maru were held for six days on the open tennis court. While there, the prisoners were afforded no sanitary conditions whatsoever. They were given a little water, but not fed until December 17th, when the Japanese brought a bag of rice. Each man received three tablespoons of rice and a quarter spoon of salt. POWs received the same amount of raw rice two more times while they were on the tennis court. The Japanese excuse for not giving the POWs cooked food was that they were going to be moved soon, but the guards were seen eating cooked food on several occasions. On a 15-foot wide strip, the prisoners established their hospital. The hospital consisted of two sheets and a couple of raincoats stretched to give protection from the sun. The Japanese furnished no medical supplies, and of course the half-clothed Americans had none. The first major operation was the amputation of the arm of Marine Corporal by Lieutenant Colonel Jack W. Swartz, surgeon of the famous Hospital No. 2 on Bataan. There was no anesthetic, no scalpel. The arm was removed with a cauterized razor blade. The Marine lived for five days on the exposed tennis court, then died. The prevalent disease was dysentery with its attendant diarrhea, and with no drugs to control it, several of the POWs died while at the tennis court. As the prisoners watched, the Orioko Maru was sunk by unending waves of fighters from the USS Hornet. The wreck of the Orioko Maru lies in 17 to 25 meters of water in an area of the bay with probably the worst visibility.
The wreck has undergone extensive demolition over the past 75 years to allow safe passage for passing vessels. It now resembles a big, tangled mess of twisted steel. Though the ship's anchor, propeller, and some of the aircraft engines she was carrying as cargo can still be seen. On December 21 and 22, the POWs were taken by 22 trucks to San Fernando, Pampanga. On December 23rd, at about 10 p.m., the Japanese interpreter came and spoke to the ranking American officer about moving these seriously ill POWs back to Manila, where they would receive medical treatment. They were loaded into a truck, but instead of Manila, they were taken to the Campo Santo de San Fernando Cemetery, where they were beheaded and buried in a mass grave. About 10 a.m. on December 24, the POWs were taken to the train station. They saw that the station had been hit by bombings and that the cars they were to board had bullet holes in them from strafing. 100 to 200 were packed into boxcars with four guards. The doors of the boxcars were kept closed and the heat in the cars was terrible. 10 to 15 POWs rode on the roofs of the cars along with two guards. The Japanese guards told the POWs to wave white rags at the American airplanes to prevent them attacking the train. On December 25th, the POWs disembarked at San Fernando La Union and walked two kilometers to a schoolyard on the southern outskirts of the town. On the morning of December 26th, the POWs were marched to a beach. During this time, the prisoners were allowed one handful of rice and a canteen of water. The heat from the sun was so bad that men drank seawater and died. 1,070 POWs were crammed into the number two hold of the Inori Maru. The ship had been used to haul cattle, and the POWs were held in the same stalls that the cattle had been held in. The remaining prisoners boarded the Brazil Maru and were held in three different holds. In the lower hold, the POWs were lined up in companies of 108 men. Each man had four feet of space. Men who attempted to get fresh air by climbing the ladders were shot by the guards. The Inora and Brazil Maroos left the Philippines on December 27th and headed north, reaching Takao, now known as Kaohsiung Harbor, in Taiwan on New Year's Day. In the early morning of the 9th, just as the men were consuming their meager breakfast ration of rice, American aircraft from the USS Hornet launched an attack on Takao Harbor and bombed and strafed many of the ships. Several bombs fell on the Inora Maru and one exploded near the edge of the first hold, killing and wounding more than 300 of the POWs. The ship did not sink and remains of the dead POWs were removed and buried in a mass grave nearby. In 1946, they were exhumed and after time of storage in Shanghai, China, later sent to Punchbowl and reburied in 20 communal graves at the Punchbowl Cemetery marked as unknowns. The survivors were put aboard Brazil Maru, which arrived in Moji, Japan on January 29, 1945. Only 550 of the 1,619 men who sailed from Manila were still alive. 150 more men died in Japan, Taiwan, and Korea in the following months, leaving only 403 survivors to be liberated from Japanese prisoner of war camps in August and September 1945. At the Tokyo War Crimes Trials, Jun Saburo Toshino, former lieutenant and guard commandant aboard the Hell Ships, was found guilty of murdering and supervising the murder of at least 16 men and was sentenced to death as a Class B war criminal at Yokohama. Shosuke Wada, whose charges paralleled those of Toshino, was an official interpreter for the guard group. Both Toshino and Wada had supervised the San Fernando murders. Wada was found guilty of causing the deaths of numerous American Allied prisoners of war by neglecting to transmit to his superiors requests for adequate quarters, food, drinking water, and medical attention. Wada was sentenced to life imprisonment at hard labor. All the other guards received long prison terms. Shin Kajiyama was master of the ship Orioko Maru. When the Orioko Maru was sunk, he took charge of the Brazil Maru and completed the voyage to Moji, Japan via Takao. At the Tokyo War Crimes trial, Kajiyama was acquitted as, quote, he had no chance to prevent any atrocities, unquote. Thank you for watching this episode of Pacific War Stories. Please like and subscribe. Thank you.